If you have your Bible with you or want to use one of those in the back of the pew, I'm going to be reading from the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 3, uh, beginning with the uh, uh, 23rd verse, and I'm going to read down through chapter 4, verse 7. It says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you an heir. The story was told of a young man who had gone to the movie theater uh, with some other people, and as the lights in the theater began to dim, uh, he was coming loaded down with popcorn, drinks, and candy, and uh, when he got in the theater itself, the lights were already dim. And he walked down the aisle very slowly looking for the group that he had come with. And uh, he didn't see them, so he made about three or four trips. And uh, that last trip down, he just stopped about middle way and he said, Is there anyone here who recognizes me? You know, uh, we all want to belong don't we? We all want to be known by others and know that someone out there cares about us. We need to belong. We need to be a part of a community. That's why we belong to clubs and civic organizations and uh, fraternities and those kind of things because we need to be associated with people that are like us or close to being like us. Uh, They complement each other. Now, even Jesus needed a support group around him. When he started his ministry, it was not very long until he had chosen 12 individuals. And those 12 individuals traveled with him. They, he taught them. Uh, they needed to learn. Uh, there were a lot of things they needed to know before they were ever going to be able to carry out the ministry that Jesus had for them to do. But even among those 12 who were really close to Jesus, there were three who were closer even than the other nine, Peter, James, and John. And we refer to them as the inner circle. Uh, They experienced and saw some things that the other disciples did not see and experience. Listen to what Jesus said to them the night that he was betrayed. He said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. No longer were they just servants. 
No longer were they just friends. They were people that Jesus loved, Jesus cared about very deeply, and who Jesus was giving a specific task to do. The disciples needed that assurance. And more than anything, they needed the sense of belonging to a family, which is no wonder that God used the family as a way to illustrate His people. Families are important. We're not just servants. We're not just friends as Christians. We are the children of God. Now, Paul said to the Romans, All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of adoption when we cried, Abba, Father. It is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So this morning, what I want us to do for just a few minutes is I want us to look at being heirs of God. To be an heir of God, first of all, we have got to be children of God. Now, Jesus made it possible for us to become God's children by dying on the cross, being buried, and being resurrected unto life. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, says, this is of first importance. This is the first thing that you have to understand. Jesus gave his life for you. He was crucified. He was buried. And he was resurrected. So that we could be born not of the flesh, but of the water and of the Spirit. This process we might describe as an adoption. Adoption is a special way of getting a child. The parents deliberately choose a child and then do whatever is necessary you know, to make the child theirs. Isn't that exactly what God did? God chose us. He wanted us to be His children. And then God did everything He could to make it possible for us to become His children. When the adopted child gives all of those rights, then he becomes an heir of that family. Isn't that what the Scripture says about us as Christians? God had one Son, only one, Jesus. All of the rest of us are adopted into that family through Christ. And Jesus says we are joint heirs with Jesus. The story was told of a Bible class teacher who was uh, registering children for her Sunday school class. And uh, she wanted their birth dates and so forth. And uh, she asked, uh, there were two boys in the class who were brothers. And so she asked them, uh, you know, uh, what their birthday was and uh, so forth. And one of them spoke up. He said, we're seven years old. He said, my birthday is on April the 8th, and his is on April the 20th. And the teacher was kind of confused about that. She said, now, that ain't possible. The other one spoke up and said, yes, it is. said, one of us is adopted. And before she even thought, she said, which one? The boys looked at each other and kind of smiled said, we ask our dad that. 
And he said, he just smiled and said, I don't remember. Nothing is greater. Nothing is greater than being aware that we are the children of God. The children of the living God adopted into his family and joint heirs with Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul said, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, God has given us every spiritual blessing in heaven. In Christ, He chose us before the world was made. In His love, He chose us to be His holy people without blame before Him. And before the world was made, God decided to make us His own children through Jesus Christ. That was what He wanted and what pleased Him. As God's children, look at what He does. He loves us when we didn't deserve love. He protects us. He provides for us. Everything we have comes as a result of God. God hears us when we talk to Him. God disciplines us when we disobey Him. He honors us in special ways. And He claims us for His own. With all of that that God does for us, shouldn't we as His children want to be as close to Him as possible? Be as much like He wants us to be as we can possibly be? Why is it then that so many of those who are children of God want to always be in the outer fringe of things. They don't want to do anything really dishonest, but right out on the border. You know, it seems to me that as God's children, in all that God does for us, we ought to want to be as close to the Father as we can possibly be. That we ought to want to grow to be more like Him every day. That we ought to take seriously what Jesus, or what God says. When Peter was writing, he says, God says, be holy because I am holy. That's what God wants out of us. Well, what do we inherit? If we're heirs of God, there's got to be an inheritance. So what do we inherit? Now, I want you to be aware of the fact that we are joint heirs with Christ. What does that mean? Well, what does it mean when you have a joint bank account? Does it mean that you can only write checks on half of it? Or you can write checks on the whole thing? If it's a joint account, you can write checks on the whole thing. We're joint heirs with Christ. What does that mean? That means we're going to inherit what God has for us as His children. Now, Let's look at what we inherit. First of all, we're going to inherit a new body. Paul told the Philippians, And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Now, there are a lot of things about the body of Jesus after the resurrection I don't really understand. I mean, I, I know it was visible. I know you could touch it. I know that Jesus ate with his disciples. And yet I know he passed through closed doors. He would appear and disappear and all that. I don't understand a lot of that. But I don't have to understand it. All I have to do is believe that God did it. And God does it. And Jesus did. But Je just says, we're going to have a body like Him. 
think about it. No more aches. No more pains. No more wheelchairs. Everything. It's going to be perfect. The new body is going to be perfect for eternal living. Not time, but eternal. Paul told the Corinthians, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body designed to live forever. We're also going to have a new home. Now we know if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where you are, where I am, you may be also. We're going to be with Jesus in a new home. John said in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. We won't need the sun. We won't need the moon, because the Son of God will be the light thereof. I don't know all that the new home's going to have, but I know it's going to be glorious. Now, we build new houses. We're excited about the house that we build, and we're excited about moving in, and all of those things are great. I remember when we got our house, we moved in. And, but let me tell you, I don't care. Uh, uh, <laughs> on, the, uh, on the way to Greenville, going through Stokes on 903, uh, there's a house on the right. They've been working on for years. And uh, I, I have absolutely no idea how fabulous that house may be. But I can tell you this. I don't care how fabulous it is. It won't compare nothing to what God's prepared for His children. We're going to have a new home. We're going to have a new life. And this is what He has promised us, even eternal life. Now everything we know anything about now starts and ends. No more. It's going to be eternal. No end to it. Paul said, or he kind of called it the crown of life. He said, I fought a good fight, finished the course, he said, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of life or a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give unto me upon that day, but not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. We're going to have all we need there. We're going to eat from the tree of life, and we're going to drink, the tree, uh, drink from the water of life, and we're going to live forever. Every need met. We are a part, as Christians, a part of God's will. 
God has an inheritance for us. All we have to do is claim it. Now, it's our choice uh, whether we claim the inheritance or whether we don't. I mean, that, that's solely up to us. God has done His part. He's made it available. And it's all up to us as to whether we accept it or not. Now, <clears throat> I read about an elderly gentleman who had a serious hearing problem and had had it for a number of years and when he went to the doctor the uh, doctor uh, got him to a hearing specialist and they did uh, some things for him and his hearing improved greatly but the doctor told him he said now I want you to come back in about a month and let me check everything so he went back in about a month, and uh, the doctor told him, he said, uh, he was all excited. He said, man, he said, your hearing's almost perfect. He said, your family must really be excited about how well you can hear. He said, oh, he said, I haven't told them yet. <laughs> he said, I, I just uh, sit around and listen to the conversations. In fact, he said, I've changed my will three times. <laughs> well, God's not going to change His will. His will is for all of those who accept Him as their Lord and Savior and commit their lives to Him. Everyone should have a will. It's important that we have a will. But it's not near as important as being included in the will of God. Fred Craddock and his wife took, uh, he tells about them taking a vacation and going to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And one night they had gone out to a restaurant, to a nice restaurant to eat and uh, just to be alone and have some time together and so forth. And uh, while they were waiting on their food, they noticed a elderly white-headed fella just kind of visiting from table to table. And Craddock whispered to his wife, said, I hope he doesn't come over here. He didn't want to be bothered and didn't want him interrupting the, the time they had together. But, lo and behold, he come over to the table anyway. And uh, he said, uh, uh, where are you folks from? And they said, we're from uh, Oklahoma. Splendid state, he said. Uh, although I understand I've never actually been there. He said, what do you do for a living? And Craddock answered, he said, I'm a, a teach at the graduate school of Phillips uh, University. I teach homiletics. He said, oh, said, you teach preachers, do you? Well, I've got a story I want to tell you. And with that, he pulled up a chair and he sat down at the table with Fred Craddock and his wife. Dr. Craddock said, he groaned inwardly and said, oh no, here comes another preacher's story and it seems like everybody's got one. But the man stuck out his hand and he said, I'm Ben Hopper. I was born not far from here across the mountains. My mother was not married when I was born. So I had a hard time. When I started to school, my classmates had a name for me, and it wasn't a nice name. I used to go off by myself at recess and lunch times because my classmates taunted me and it cut so deeply. 
What was worse was going to town, he said, on Saturday afternoon and feeling every eye burning a hole through me. And they were all wondering who my real dad was. He said, when I was 12 years old, a new preacher came to our church. He said, and I would always go in late and slip out early. But one day, he said, the preacher had the benediction so quick, he said, I didn't have time to get out, and I got caught, had to go out with everybody else. He said, when I got to the door, uh, just about ready to go out, he said, I felt a big hand come down on my shoulder, and he said, it was the preacher looking down at me, and he said, uh, who are you, son? Whose boy are you? He said, I could feel all that weight coming down on me like a big black cloud. Even the preacher putting me down. But he said, as he looked down, studying my face, he began to smile and he said, uh, Wait a minute. I know who you are, I see the family resemblance. You're a child of God. And with that, he said, he slapped me on the rump and said, Son, you've got a great inheritance. Go claim it. He said to Dr. Craddock, that was the most important sentence that was ever said to me in my life. At that, he got up, shook hands with him, and away he went. And Craddock thought for a moment. And then he realized The state of Tennessee had elected a man, governor twice. It was Ben Hopper. I want you to know, as a child of God, you've got a great inheritance. Go claim it.